Last evening, we uh, talked about the need to defend the faith against the variety of challenges that come to us in the unbelieving world. We saw a lot of different kinds of antagonism brought up against the Christian faith, and we saw that the Bible requires you to be able to answer them all. Now, that doesn't mean the Bible requires you to give your life to studying philosophy and all the different arguments against Christianity. It does mean that you are to be prepared by knowing how to think as a Christian and therefore interact with those who are not Christians who are hostile to your faith. The key to being able to pull down all antagonistic reasoning that's raised up against the knowledge of God is to bring every one of your thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. That means that you will not be neutral. You will not be taking an open-minded approach to your studies. You're going to approach your studies with certain commitments. Many universities, most universities, the unbelieving world will tell you you can't do that. That's not fair. Everyone must be neutral. And I gave you two things to learn about neutrality last night. Can you tell me what they are? They aren't and, and you shouldn't be. Once again, they aren't, and you shouldn't be. That's right. The university is not neutral, and we saw a lot of different ways in which that's the case. Most importantly, we saw that the Bible tells you they are not neutral, cannot be neutral, because their minds are hostile against the truth and against the Lord of the truth, Jesus Christ. And you shouldn't be neutral. You should be rather set aside, sanctified and consecrated by the Word of God, God's Word of truth. You shouldn't be so immoral as to try to serve two masters. You should not be robbed of all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge by refusing to begin your studies with the fear of the Lord. You shouldn't be neutral. The Bible tells us that the unbelieving world, the unbeliever himself, is antagonistic to Christianity because of his or her philosophy of life. They have a complete overall outlook or view of the world and how they know what they know and how they should live in this world which stands diametrically opposed and systematically conflicts with the Christian's understanding of reality and how we know what we know and how we should live our lives. There are two philosophies at war here, two worldviews in conflict. I said everyone has a worldview in which certain things are taken for granted. A worldview made up of presuppositions that are not confirmed by the uh, procedures of natural science and yet are crucial for relating all of our experience and interpreting all of our experience. Worldviews become the crux to defending the faith and thinking as a Christian. We saw some of the key issues with respect to worldviews. Those issues are the issues of creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. The secular world, the unbelieving world, or if you will, in the language of the philosophers, we have questions having to do with the nature of reality, metaphysics. This will be on the quiz at the end of the course, so make sure it's in your notes. Well, we have questions of... quiz? What are we talking about here? Yeah, now get your mind off those fire extinguishers and get back onto the lecture. Epistemology is another one of those things philosophers study. We call it the doctrine of revelation. Generally speaking, it's the theory of knowledge. And then finally, unbelieving philosophers and believing philosophers alike talk about ethics, how we should live our lives, what is the nature of man, how does he take care of guilt, how does he live in harmony with his fellow man. There are different worldviews out there and they are systematically opposed to each other. I left up on the board for you a review of the different worldviews that we encounter. And I realize that this is where the going got a little tough last night because there was a lot of new vocabulary. If you find yourself terribly discouraged when you get new vocabulary like this and it kind of takes away your motivation for study, you should rethink whether you want to go to college. And of course, I, I would hope all of you would overcome that and you would go on to college, but quite honestly, if that is going to discourage you, you're going to have a very tough time in college. A good deal of education is learning vocabulary, learning new concepts and the words that go with them. And some of the ones that we learned last night were monism, dualism, atomism, pragmatism. 
Now, before we give some detail on each one of those, let's just review. What is monism? The view that all of reality, the nature of reality, is one, and particularly a spiritual kind of oneness. Dualism says, no, all of reality is two. It's two kinds of things, mind and matter, spirit and flesh, if you will. And then there's the atomists who say, oh, no, it's not just two. Reality, which is material in nature, breaks down to an infinite number of things, atoms. And then there are those who say, well, who can know? And really, who cares? The only thing that counts is living our lives and being successful and solving our problems. You have the pragmatic approach to life. Okay, so monism, dualism, atomism, pragmatism. That's one way to map out the terrain. These terms are going to be on your quiz as well, so make sure you have them in your notes. What's an example of monism? Hinduism, that's right, probably the leading illustration. Are there other Hindu-like philosophies of life that are not, strictly speaking, Hindu? That's right, New Age thinking, Hare Krishnas, I mentioned Christian science, and really we could go on and give a number of others as well. Jainism and Sikhism and so forth. Dualism says there are two kinds of reality, material and spiritual or mental, mind and matter. And therefore, what we live for goes beyond this physical world and our experience of time. There are enduring principles. Plato was an idealist because he held that there are ideals, ideas and forms that go beyond time and space. There are a lot of people who are functional Platonists. Many housewives believe that we should live, you know, in goodwill toward people, and there are principles of, of decency and, um, and uh, courtesy and so forth that we should live for, even though we're nothing more uh, from a physical standpoint than animals that evolved from the primordial slime. These people are idealists. They think there is something that goes beyond momentary experience in time and in space. We have intuitionists who say that we just have a remembrance of these things or we intuit them. We can't learn them from our physical experience. We have Stoics and moralists who tell us there are duties we should live for and according to even though we can't find those things out in our natural experience in the temporal order. Monism, dualism, the third thing was atomism, or if you will, materialism with the view that everything breaks down to very small bits of matter. Within the atomistic school of thought, I distinguished two families, two subfamilies. And they squabble with each other even though it's only a family squabble. And those two subfamilies are the deterministic wing of the atomist family, and then the free will wing, or the hedonistic wing, those who say we do make choices and what we choose is to please ourselves. On the deterministic side of the atomistic family, those who say there is no freedom, you'll find the behaviorist, particularly in psychology, but going beyond that, of course, and you'll find the Marxists, particularly in history and economics, but beyond that as well. The behaviorist says human behavior is determined by antecedent causes. Human behavior is predictable if you knew all of the physical uh, stimuli and response conditioning that went into a physical organism. The Marxist, on the other hand, says more broadly that history is determined by economic forces, particularly in class struggle and that we can predict the outcome of history because of those forces. Okay, that's the deterministic wing of the atomist family. And then we'll finish our review very quickly now, looking at the free will or hedonistic side of the atomist family. Remember that we have the egoist, I'm what counts, I, I live for my own pleasure. Uh, libertarianism is usually an expression of that. We have the utilitarian subfamily, that says we should live for the utility of other people, that is to say we should live for the good of society as a whole, the greatest good of the greatest number, greatest happiness of the greatest number. And then finally we have those who say it makes no difference what you choose as long as you choose authentically. 
not choosing because there is a god or a teacher or some kind of force that makes you do what you do. And there we find the existentialist. You simply exist and then you choose what your essence will be, the kind of person you will be. So we've reviewed monism, dualism, atomism, and then finally the pragmatist says no one knows what reality is like and no one cares. The only thing that counts, you see, is that you get along well in life and you solve your problems and you adjust to in your environment and you survive. That's really all that counts. You can kind of um, get an idea of the flow of history in terms of a little story about an elephant being on a barge sitting offshore. And the question comes up, how can we get the elephant to shore? How are we going to get the elephant from that barge to the mainland? And you can think of the history of philosophy somewhat like this. If you were studying in Europe on the continent, what we call continental philosophy, the question would be, is the elephant real? If you studied in Britain, if you were a British philosopher, you would be asking questions like, how much does the elephant weigh? Continental philosophers say, is it real? British philosophers want to know the empirical, scientific aspect of it, how much does it weigh? But if you were in America and studied pragmatic philosophy, you'd be saying, how much will you pay me? I don't care if it's real and I don't care what it weighs, just what's it going to cost you to do it? Okay, so pragmatism is the philosophy that says who cares about all these other theoretical questions? Success, now that doesn't necessarily mean material or financial success, even though my story is built on that. Pragmatism says success in problem solving and adjusting to your environment is what you live for. The far end of pragmatism is the skeptic who says we don't know anything for sure. And when you become skeptical, you open yourself up to what I call the sophistic approach to life. All that counts is manipulating people to get your way. And the cynical approach to life that says there's really nothing worth living for and everybody's a fraud. Uh, these people don't usually have a whole lot of uh, campaigners and evangelists for them because in the nature of the case, who wants to promote cynicism? Okay, these are different approaches to philosophy, different approaches to life. They are different approaches to what is real, how we know what we know and how we should live our lives. To put it simply, they are different approaches to metaphysics, what is real, to epistemology, how do we know what we know, and to ethics, how should we live our lives. Beginning today's new material, it's obvious that we should be aware then of the antithesis that exist between world views. When you have an unbelieving professor or roommate who says, I don't believe in miracles, or miracles are impossible, or I don't believe in the Genesis story of creation, or I don't believe that God can communicate to man because he is infinite and man is finite, or I don't believe that there is a God at all. When you have these kind of particular belief conflicts, you are going to start thinking now in terms of a broader conflict of world views. It's not just one particular that separates you from the unbeliever. It's a whole approach to life and knowledge and reality. It's your worldview over against his or her worldview. You have to be aware that there is an antithesis. There's a word that you should get familiar with as well. There is a conflict, an irresolvable conflict between two outlooks on reality, knowledge, and ethics. The Bible tells us of this antithesis from cover to cover. The Bible tells us from beginning to end, the whole Christian story, in a sense, is a story about this antithesis. You remember when Adam and Eve fell into sin, they felt guilty before God. And the Bible tells us that the voice of God was walking in the cool of the evening in the Garden of Eden, and Adam and Eve were not to be found. Well, that's strange. Where is God's? highest and best creation, that which was made in his own image. 
Well, Adam and Eve are out in the bushes hiding. Perhaps the most probing question in all of the Bible is that question, Adam, where are you? Why are you hiding from me? Which is preposterous, of course. God knows everything. Adam is hiding. Why were Adam and Eve hiding? Because they were ashamed, they were guilty, and they were fearful, properly so, fearful of the judgment of God. Because he had said, in the day that you eat, you will surely die. And they showed that they were dead already, spiritually, in that they ran from God. They did not have that fellowship what constitutes life in this world. They were beginning to feel the alienation and separation, which eventually will be hell, where God says, depart from me into everlasting darkness. Already they knew spiritual death as they hid from God. And as God finds Adam and Eve and addresses them, he gives the promise of salvation, but the promise of salvation comes in the form of the declaration of an antithesis that will never be taken away. God says to Eve that he will put enmity between her seed, or the seed of the serpent, and her seed. That is to say, one is going to come through the natural birth process that will be a son of Eve, and that one who comes is going to destroy the tempter. But there's going to be antithesis between her seed and all those who belong to the Messiah, who belong to the Savior, and the seed of the serpent. And we see that enmity come to expression immediately in the biblical story after Adam and Eve leave the Garden of Eden and they begin their lives and they have two sons, they have more children than that, we know by implication, but they had two sons, Cain and Abel, and immediately the enmity was seen because one son offered a sacrifice to God that was acceptable to him because he had a heart of faith and he approached God in that attitude and the other son did not. And because of that enmity, the son that was not acceptable to God slew the son that was. Here you have the hatred of the world against God's people already in seminal form. We see that enmity when later in the biblical account God's people are going out of Egypt and across the wilderness and finally into the promised land to conquer the promised land, there to experience the blessings of God's kingdom and his presence in their midst at the tabernacle, later the temple. And God tells them when they go into the land, you are to destroy the people of this land. They are abominable in my sight and you are to have nothing to do with them. No covenant is to be made with them. You're to destroy everything about them, every living thing. No harmony between the world and God's people. Rather, antithesis. That antithesis is, I wish I could tell you the whole Bible story today, I don't have time, but let's jump ahead in the Bible. When Jesus comes into the world, you see that antithesis and that hostility and that enmity as well. Here you have the Christ child who is born and has to flee to Egypt because of the hostility of Herod and the unbelieving world against God's own Son of all things, the Messiah, the one sent to save. Jesus, when he begins his earthly ministry, has opposition even from the religious leaders of the day. And the day comes when he says to them, you are of your father, the devil. This is all about what God was talking about at the very beginning. You are, of the, you are the seed of the wicked one, and that's why you oppose me. Of course, that opposition is most clearly seen at the crucifixion, where the entire world is turned against the Son of God, including his closest disciples. Even Peter, who brashly says he will not deny the Lord, denies him three times. And Jesus alone dies for the sins of God's people. You see the antithesis between the world and the kingdom of God. You see it in the book of Acts, in the opposition to the fledgling Christian church. You see those who are the practitioners of magic and the occult opposing the apostles because when people are converted and when the power of the gospel comes, these magical charms and books and so forth are burned openly as a way of, of renouncing those things of the world. And so you see the antithesis and the opposition. You see the Jews persecuting God's people. You see the Roman Empire persecuting God's people. 
Consider just a couple verses in the New Testament. Look at Colossians 1.21, where Paul describes for us the mindset of the unbelieving world and the unbeliever, specifically the individual unbeliever. Colossians 1.21. And you being in time past alienated, and here's the expression I want you to get in your notes, you being in time past alienated and enemies in your mind by your evil works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. In the past, when you were in the unbelieving world, when you were in the unregenerate state, that natural state by which you come into the world, you were an enemy of God. God said there will be enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman between God's people and the world. And all those who are in the world, Paul describes as having a mindset that is at enmity with God. You are enemies in your mind. Look at another verse here in the New Testament before we finish our survey. James 4, verse 4. James says, Ye adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore would be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We cannot get away from the antithesis, the systematic conflict between the world and God's people. Indeed, the way the world thinks, enemies in their minds with the way that you think, trying to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And then at the end of the biblical story, or at the end of history, you know that God will confirm that enmity eventually when for all eternity there's a separation of those who believe in Jesus Christ and belong to Him and those who do not. A separation between the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares. And God will say, depart from me into everlasting darkness where there is the weeping, wailing, and the gnashing of teeth, where life is utterly meaningless. And there is nothing but conflict and torture and pain. Depart from me. Since you did not want to live in fellowship with me, since you would not pray, thy will be done, then God says, I say to you, your will be done, then don't live with me, and we'll make that our eternal relationship. What a dreadful day that will be. But it will be the great day of antithesis as well. The day where heaven and hell, you see, show that there is this conflict, and it will be forever. All right. You must beware, then, of the antithesis between the unbelieving world and yourself, between the philosophy of the unbeliever, the unbelieving professor, and your own philosophy. Unbelievers, in principle, write that down, in principle, unbelievers will think and behave in a systematically different way than believers do. In principle, believers and unbelievers will agree on nothing. They will not do anything in the same way in this world. They will not see anything in a common fashion. Now you see why I said in principle, because you know very well that believers and unbelievers do say the same thing many times and do behave the same way many times. And so the point I'm making is not one about consistency in the way we actually find things worked out in the world, but I'm talking about the way things would be in principle if the unbeliever could live up to his or her philosophy and if the believer lived consistently with his philosophy there would be in principle a total antithesis of thought and behavior between them and that's the lead-in then to a very interesting question what should we say when they agree when the unbeliever tells you something about the War of 1812 and you don't have any reason to disagree with that. You, you believe that too. What should we do when unbelievers balance their checkbooks in the same way that we balance our checkbooks as Christians? And when they plant peach trees, they follow the same procedures we follow when we plant peach trees. What do we say when unbelievers say correct things about the socio-political order or about economics? or even in some cases about philosophy and literature and the interpretation of history. 
What do we do when they live their lives in a way that's similar to us? They drive on the proper side of the street. They try to be good citizens. They give their children gifts at Christmas. There should be a systematic conflict, but we don't see that in actual fact. We don't see the antithesis at every point worked out. And when that happens, you need to ask the question, which worldview comports with what is being said and done where we see outward conformity and agreement between ourselves and the world. Which of the worldviews, the unbeliever's worldview or the believer's worldview, makes sense out of balancing your checkbook, driving on the right side of the street, giving gifts to your children, saying the correct things about the War of 1812 or about our economic system and plight, whatever it may be. How does the believer, how does the unbeliever agree with the believer and vice versa. How does that come about? Which of their underlying worldviews accounts for it? You probably can tell where I'm going with this. The key to your defending the Christian faith and to thinking as a Christian in whatever department you study, whatever, whoever it is that you're speaking with, the key is going to be showing that the unbeliever's worldview cannot make sense out of those things that you do in common. Cannot make sense out of moral decency and love of children. Cannot make sense out of a mathematical order by which checkbooks are balanced. Cannot make sense out of the interpretation of history or the procedures of science or the absolutes of ethics. When we see unbelievers acting like believers, we need to point that out. We need to say, you are not living up to your philosophy. You got something of an illustration of that last night when we first of all talked about atomism. And I spoke of Epicurus and Democritus, the ancient Greek atomist, materialist. Epicurus in particular taught that the world is made up of an infinite number of very small bits of matter called atoms. And these atoms, he said, were falling through infinite space. And that whatever happens in this world is due to the falling of the atoms through space. And yet he went on to teach that mankind makes decisions, every man and woman makes decisions with the purpose of securing pleasure, and that's what they should do. And I said, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to talk about making choices or having free will when all we are are bits of matter falling through space subject to whatever the laws of the physical world are. See, when you run into the modern Epicurean, when you run into the modern materialist today who has a sense of ethics, no matter what it's about, by the way, maybe the ethics of, you know, partying for that matter, even though um, they have a bad set of ethics, that they have any kind of ethic at all makes no sense if man is nothing more than some kind of physical organism in time and space made up of atoms, whether falling through space or not. So that when you see the modern Epicurean agreeing with you on certain things, such as we ought to be decent to our neighbors, we ought to help people who are stranded on the road and so forth, you can evangelize that person and defend your Christian faith by pressing them to say you're not really being consistent with your worldview. On your worldview, there is no right or wrong about helping stranded travelers or being good to people. There is nothing like a law of reason that we should follow when we study. On your worldview, we can't help but do what we do. You're not living up to your own worldview. In fact, what you are doing is that you are proclaiming, professing one thing, and then living in terms of my outlook on life. To a certain degree, you want to see the world as I see the world, or as the Bible would have us see the world. You want to see the world in terms of God's revelation, but you don't want the whole story. You don't want to have to bow the knee to God. You don't want to have to be subservient. You don't want to have to confess your sin. You don't want to have to have faith in the Savior. You want to get rid of all that, but you want to keep the parts of the Christian worldview that are beneficial. And so you're really living, as Cornelius Van Til 
used to say, on borrowed capital. And what if I had a great idea for opening a hot fudge Sunday shop? I got to thinking, you know what this world needs more than anything else is not love, it's hot fudge Sundays. And they'll sell. In fact, maybe I've got a community that could really use a hot fudge Sunday shop. And so I think, you know, I'm, I can make a bundle here, but the problem is to make money, it takes money. I can't open the shop unless I have the money to rent the space or buy the building to get my supplies, to hire workers, do advertising and things like that. So let's say I go to somebody else. I go to, say, Gary North, and I say, Gary, I got a great idea for making money. Hot fudge Sundays is what the world needs, and I've got the place where we can sell them and make a bundle. But I haven't got the money to do it. So Dr. North is very generous, and he sees a good opportunity for investment, and he gives me this money to open the hot fudge Sunday shop. But then after I do that, when people come in and they say, well, you know, this is a great hot fudge Sunday shop that you and Dr. North put together. I say, what do you mean, Dr. North? Who are you talking about, Dr. North? This is my shop. I run this place. This is my building. It's my business. And I want all the credit for it. And you'd say, well, no, wait a minute now, Dr. Bonson. Aren't you living on borrowed capital? Didn't you go get your capital for starting this business from somebody else? Doesn't he deserve the credit for this as well? In the same way, the unbeliever wants to pretend that the hot fudge Sunday shop is his own. Now, he may be very accomplished in literature. That's his hot fudge Sunday shop. He may be very accomplished in science. He may be a brain surgeon. He may be a, a brilliant doctor or a researcher or a physicist or somebody who can send rockets to the moon or a great military strategist. He may be an artist, he may be a performer, he may be any number of things, but the problem with him or her always is those accomplishments are made possible because he or she is living on borrowed capital. The unbeliever lives in terms of the Christian worldview all the while denying the Christian worldview. And what we need to do is to press the antithesis with people and show them their inconsistency. You're not living up to your philosophy. I can give you, I think, a very easy illustration of people not living up to their philosophy. It comes from a previous generation, but I have reason to think it fits every generation. When I was in college, back in the good old days of the Vietnam War, it was also the day of the sexual revolution. Now, there was sexual immorality before my day, believe it or not. But in my day, it became very open, became, if you will, a professed philosophy of life, the playboy philosophy. People were proud of this. In fact, we were to shake off the shackles of the past and tradition and religious taboos about sex, and everybody was to enjoy themselves and do whatever they wanted, as long as it was a meaningful relationship. I always wondered why it had to be meaningful if it was wide open. But nevertheless, you had the sexual revolution. So now, if I were evangelizing a college student and I found out that he was shacking up with his girlfriend, that would be a point of declaring, of course, God's standards and the disobedience of this person and the need for this person to seek the forgiveness provided in Jesus Christ. But you see, if the person I'm talking to doesn't want to hear the gospel message and doesn't want to have to feel guilty, he or she could say, oh, well, I don't believe this stuff about there being right and wrong with respect to sex. And you continue the conversation, and you'll find out that this same person is utterly indignant at the government of the United States for being involved in the military conflict in Vietnam. And will say it is utterly immoral to kill people for the purposes of the United States, to try to impose our will around the world or to rape the world, you know, for our benefit. And you get all this high flown rhetoric about the immorality of doing that. Now, if you're evangelizing this person, if you're trying to defend the faith of this person, aren't you going to catch on to that contradiction? Do you this afternoon hear the contradiction? On the one hand, right and wrong is determined by every individual. You know, if it feels good, do it. It's different strokes for different folks. That's what you hear when you talk about sexual ethics. 
And then on the other hand, you hear this absolute moralistic, completely committed notion of ethics that it's wrong to go to war. Well, you see, the unbeliever can't have it both ways. And you've got to show the internal contradictions in the unbeliever system of thought and life. You need to show that the unbeliever cannot live up to his or her professed philosophy. In the case I've given you, you've got the philosophy of relativism. But then the unbeliever doesn't live up to that. To a certain degree, the unbeliever wants a Christian approach to life when he or she says, the government of the United States is not policeman of the world, has no right to go to Vietnam and enter into that conflict. Now, I'm not going to get into the rights and wrongs of the Vietnam conflict, but it's just the general idea that you can condemn some kind of military involvement, some kind of war, when you say it's different strokes for different folks. If you're going to live consistently with your philosophy, Mr. Unbeliever, you should say it's different strokes for different folks. So if you like killing people, go to war. If that's what makes life meaningful for you, then you go to war. I'm going to stay home and I'm going to make love rather than war, but I mean it's, you know, different strokes for different folks. Now that's what consistency would demand. But unbelievers don't wish to be consistent. They wish to be arbitrary and have their way. They aren't neutral, they aren't objective, they in fact have an axe to grind. And their axe, the axe they grind is with God and God's word and God's authority speaking to them. So they will renounce the Christian worldview and then when it's convenient live in terms of the Christian worldview. You need to be aware of the antithesis between unbelieving thought and believing thought you need to press that antithesis and then watch for the inconsistencies in the unbeliever's worldview. And they will always be there. I can only give you so many illustrations in the time that I'm with you. Um, you're going to find plenty of your own as well. Believe me, they are always there. The Bible tells you they will always be there because the unbeliever cannot change the nature of reality just because he or she doesn't believe it is what it is. A person who says, I don't believe I have tuberculosis, is going to die anyway. Unless, of course, the tuberculosis is treated. But when a person has tuberculosis and says, well, I just don't believe I have tuberculosis, do you think that takes it away? Of course not. In the same way, the unbeliever says, well, I don't believe that there's a God, and I don't believe in moral absolutes, and I don't believe in universals, and I don't believe in immaterial things like ideals or laws or moral principles. I don't believe in a God, and yet this is God's world. And to live in God's world, you're going to have to conform to the contours of God's world. You're going to have to get along eventually and act like this is God's world even while you're saying it's not. Another illustration, perhaps the most popular that Dr. Van Til ever used, was the illustration of the young child who sits on his father's lap and slaps his father's face, insults his father, and yet can only do so. Why? Because the father is supporting him on his lap. The unbeliever will be able to slap the face of God, speaking metaphorically, to um, be hostile and profess to not believe in God, but only because God all along is supporting him or her. The unbeliever will have to depend upon the Christian worldview to strike out against the Christian worldview. The unbeliever will have to assume certain things that only believers have the right to assume in order to argue against what the believer professes and what the Bible teaches. Now, unbelievers are not going to acknowledge that there is this antithesis between themselves and believers. They are not going to say, oh, that's right, there is in principle a hostility between God's people and the world, a hostility between the outlook of biblical revelation and what mankind comes up with by its own imagination and its own reasoning. The unbeliever will not acknowledge that antithesis, will not admit to being prejudiced, what, me prejudice? I'm perfectly open-minded. I'm objective. The unbeliever will profess neutrality and innocence rather than acknowledge the antithesis. And now, why do you think that is? 
Why can you not go into the classroom and expect the, the professor knows there is this antithesis, is working self-consciously in terms of it, and will acknowledge it when you bring it up? The reason why the unbeliever will not acknowledge the antithesis but will rather profess neutrality is because the unbeliever must think that his or her lack of faith is not their own problem, it's not the problem of the unbeliever because he or she has an axe to grind, has a prejudice against God, is running from God even as Adam and Eve in the garden ran away from the voice of God. The unbeliever is not going to admit that. The unbeliever is going to say, well, if I don't believe in God, it's not because I'm prejudiced. It's God's fault. God hasn't given sufficient evidence to me. I'm an open-minded person. I'm an intellectual person. I'm not prejudiced. I'm objective. I'm even-handed in the treating of the evidence. So if I don't believe in God, it must be because there's not enough evidence. Don't you see? My failure to follow the Christian worldview is because God is not clear. God is not persuasive. God has not given enough to convince me. Now, I'd be convinced if the evidence were there, mind you. I could understand it, and I'd follow it, and I'd certainly give in to the truth if we're there, but... It's just not there. And that's why unbelievers love to uh, uh, give this picture of Christianity, that it's a leap of faith, it's some kind of emotional commitment that has nothing to do with the intellect. In fact, one has got to sacrifice their intellect. One has to, as it were, go contrary to what he knows to be true. <clears throat> one has got to give up reasoning in order to have this emotional commitment to Jesus. And every time you hear that, whether in those words or something similar to it, rem be reminded of what I taught you in this lecture today. The unbeliever must say it's that situation because the alternative is to say, well, the evidence is clear and the problem is with me. God has provided evidence of his existence. God has made himself clear. There is overwhelming persuasiveness to what God has shown in the world and in my heart of hearts, and I can't live apart from him. And so... I must be guilty. I must be a rebel. I must have to confess my sin and cry out to God for mercy. Unbelievers who do not wish to do that have no alternative then but to pretend that they are neutral, there is no antithesis, and God is at fault if the evidence is inadequate in their eyes. Turn in your Bibles to Romans, the first chapter, and see if this is not, in fact, what the Apostle Paul tells us about all mankind. Romans chapter 1 where I'll begin reading at the 18th verse with a few comments as we go along here. Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Okay, Paul starts by saying that God has shown himself from heaven to all mankind and particularly he is showing his wrath. What all mankind is experiencing and knowing is that God is angry with the unbeliever day by day and angry with the unbeliever's culture day by day. And his wrath is being revealed. It's made known. Now, if the unbeliever is in the position, spiritually speaking, of Adam and Eve, being guilty, being fearful of punishment, then the unbeliever is going to do what? Run and hide. Of course, the unbeliever is not going to admit that he's running and hiding. He's going to have his rationalizations and excuses. So look what Paul says. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth by means of unrighteousness. Because that which is known of God is manifest in them because God manifested it unto them. What is the unbelieving world doing? It is suppressing the well-known truth by means of unrighteousness. In so many sinful, slimy ways, the unbeliever is rationalizing and saying, oh, no, 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 that's not true, that couldn't be true, and God couldn't speak clearly to men. God hasn't done so. I'm not guilty. The unbeliever suppresses the truth. You know... I'll bet many of you have gone to pool parties in your life and you've played this game, who has the ball, right? The volleyball. And what happens is you throw the ball around and somebody hides the ball under the water by sitting on it. Hands up, 
Who's got the ball? Who's got the ball? Suppressing the volleyball underneath the surface of the water. I don't know where the ball is. There isn't a volleyball. Couldn't be a volleyball. No, no. All the while being in contact, kind of contact with the volleyball underneath the water. So the unbeliever suppresses the truth and then says, there's no truth to find. Where is it? What do you mean a volleyball? There's no volleyball. Paul says they suppress the truth in unrighteous ways. And why do they do it? Because that which is known of God is manifest in them. And you know that it's manifest in them because God's the one who did the manifesting. God manifested it and God doesn't fail to accomplish what he intends to accomplish because he is God and he is sovereign. And when God wants to get the point across, the point gets across. And it has been getting across to people throughout human history. The wrath of God is revealed and God is known in the heart of hearts of every individual. And then they suppress that truth in unrighteousness. Verse 20, For the invisible things of him since the creation of the world are clearly seen. Notice that, clearly seen. When the unbeliever says, Oh, I don't know, the evidence is sure ambiguous. Now, there's a little bit of evidence for God, but there's a lot of evidence against God. Paul says, Nah, that's not right. Because God has made it clearly seen so that he is perceived through the things that are made even as everlasting power and divinity, that they may be without excuse. God has made it so clear that nobody has an excuse. Nobody has a reason to not believe. They know God. They know God in their heart of hearts. They know God through the created order. They know God through his work in history. They know God. And they can hear the voice of God when they read the Bible. They know God. They can't escape it. And God has left them without any excuse whatsoever. Does that mean they don't make up excuses? Boy, they've got a zillion. But God says, none of it's going to wash. And part of your task as a Christian in defending the faith is exposing the rationalizations and the cheap shots and the inconsistencies of the unbeliever using his or her worldview to escape from God. Verse 21, because that, knowing God, they glorified him not as God, neither gave thanks, but became vain in their reasonings, and their senseless heart was darkened. Notice how they are described, knowing God. And you need to be aware of a little bit of Greek here. The Greek says, knowing the God, nantus tan theon in Greek. It's not just that they have some general idea of God. It's not that they know a God or have a God concept. It's that they know the living and true God. That's the most frightful thing. There's very little to be frightened of in God concepts, I assure you. If you look at Aristotle's concept of God, which is thought thinking itself, thought, thinking, thought. There's nothing to run away from. In fact, on Aristotle's concept of God, this God doesn't even think about the world. It only thinks about itself. It's thought about thought. Not thought about the world, but thought about itself. God is not personal, so I have to be careful in using Christian terminology here, but on Aristotle's concept, God doesn't even know about the world, doesn't care about the world. Now that kind of God's no threat to anybody. That isn't what the unbeliever is running away from, a God concept. The unbeliever is running away from the living and true God, whose voice is heard, communicating your guilt and the coming wrath. Because knowing the living and true God, they didn't glorify him as God or give thanks. In every university of the land, I'm not saying this just out of a cheerleading spirit. I mean this from the strict standpoint of philosophical analysis in every university of this land, in every class that has ever started. Whether you are studying physics or literature or history or computers, the first thing people ought to do is give thanks to God that they are able to know things. Thanks to God that he's made himself known and made the world the way it is and given us minds by which we can learn and get along and find pleasure and solve our problems. They know God, but they won't glorify Him as God. They won't give thanks to Him 
And what's the alternative? But instead, they become vain in their reasoning, and their senseless hearts are darkened. When unbelievers will not glorify God, when they will not start the knowledge process with the fear of the Lord, when they will not presuppose the Word of God or use the Christian worldview as the context of all their study, Paul says they become vain in their reasoning. Their reasoning becomes futile. It gets mired down in all kinds of conceptual and moral problems. And this will be the key to arguing one worldview against another. The key to defending the Christian faith when there are warring worldviews is to show the vanity, the unreasonableness, and the inherent self-contradictions in the non-Christian's worldview. Showing that he has become or she has become vain in reasoning as the alternative to acknowledging the truth of God which he or she knows in their heart of hearts. When we come back this evening, I'm going to take this general approach to defending the faith and comparing worldviews, and I'm going to give you more specifics about how this is done, but specifically, I'm going to try to answer the questions that you will have uh, in the fashion that I've already given you. So this afternoon, not while the other people are lecturing, but uh, when you have some free time, you might want to jot down things that you've heard people say or maybe questions you've had, so you can throw them out and say, well, now how would you answer this or what would you do with this? And what will take some time this evening, I have a little bit more lecture, but then we'll take some time this evening beginning to illustrate how we do this. And then finally, tomorrow morning, I want you to have read my discussion of Bertrand Russell's article, Why I Am Not a Christian. Those of you who have already read it, taken a look at it, you'll see that there's a summary of how to do apologetics at the beginning of that article. And then, of course, this is one of the best known uh, pieces, short pieces of literature published in the 20th century from somebody who is a competent, well-known, high-power philosopher. And I want you to see just how easy it is if you do worldview analysis to bring him down. Thank you.